um, who does gender gender science research. And uh, Jill and her had met at the University of Florida. And since that point, I was introduced to the Center for Arts and Medicine at the University of Florida, which um, right now is leading this really large uh, national initiative called One Nation, One Project, which does arts in public health research and also practice. Um, and Jill is here for that exact purpose. Uh, she will be uh, leading a fest, or not leading, excuse me, but participating in and gathering data at a festival in Oakland on Saturday. So if you guys do not have plans on Saturday from 11 to 5 p.m., uh, there's a arts and public health festival that will be taking place in Oakland that, that Jill will be talking a little bit about today, as well as some of the other work that she's been up to for the past many years. Um, so please, uh, if you will, welcome Jill. For... It's really nice to be here and to meet you all. Thank you, Aaron inviting me and thank you all for having me and for taking time to be here this morning to be part of this conversation. Uh, I have had the pleasure of engaging with the Global Brain Health Institute in Dublin. I was at Creative Brain Week last March and I'll be there again this March, looking forward to that. So I'm a huge fan of the work that you all do and really delighted to be in your company this morning. Um, let's see. Oh. There are were you were you all able, able to hear? I don't know if I should use my audio here. Probably not. Please don't use Okay, audio. great. I just got to. We have these great ceiling mics, so. Perfect. <laughs> all right, that's great. Um, so I'm going to share some slides and sort of touch on a whole bunch of things as a way of spurring dialogue. I'm going to touch on sort of the field broadly and some of the things that are happening in the field. I'll narrow down into our Epi Arts Lab to introduce that um, program and some of the research that we're doing there. And then I'll wrap up by talking about One Nation, One Project and hope to entice you to the festival on Saturday. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share my screen here and dive in. And I welcome questions or comments or interruptions along the way so that I'm not just talking at you. I'm gonna to plan to talk for 15 or 20 minutes and then we can just open up into dialogue from there if that sounds good. Okay, great. So arts and health, hopefully this is not a new, what are these two words <laughs> doing on a screen together moment for you? Um, I suspect that you're all here because you, you at least suspect that there's a relationship between these two things. Um, and I'm really glad to say that this is a thing now in biomedicine and in public health, but it really is based on um, a very basic, old, ubiquitous notion of human art behavior, right? Human beings have made art and have expressed themselves through art, have connected through art, and in fact, have survived as a species with art as a primary essential ingredient for as long as human beings have existed, right? I was in Cairo a couple of weeks ago and saw like ancient art, right? Mm -hmm. We have had the, the urge to be creative and to create for as long as we've existed. So human art behavior is a thing, which doesn't mean that everybody loves art. Right, or wants to do art, but human art behavior or art, artification, you know, aestheticizing things is a part of our DNA as human beings. So as we talk about an idea that feels new in the context of a building like this, sometimes it's just really important to remember that it's not new. It's new to biomedicine, relatively speaking, right? And we could go, we could unpack that all day. Um, but just to note that, um, and it is in, in the context of biomedicine today, we're seeing arts and health in very significant ways in healthcare and in public health. And I'm gonna go down each of those roads just a little bit today, more so public health today and talk about population level work. Um, I wanna start by sort of setting the stage and bringing you into what's happening globally. Um, this is a particularly interesting moment. Erin and I were just talking in the car on the way over here. I've been in this field for 30 years. And in the early years, we were like renegades and pioneers and, you know, it was pretty radical. I was a dancer in hospital and I would show up and be, you know, flitting about in the hospital and it was like, what are you doing here? This is a hospital, you know? So we've come a long way 
from movement building in a very grassroots practitioner, artist driven way to a moment where now I'm spending most of my time, much of my time traveling with the World Health Organization in meetings with you know, high level ministers of health who are Princesses. driving this, right? Princesses. Um, princesses in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, they, they, I was at the UN in Copenhagen last week and in New York, the UN General Assembly had side meetings for arts and health over four days. Um, so this movement now is being driven not just by practitioners and artists and others who understand the necessity of the arts in healthcare and in public health, but by policymakers who understand the necessity for the arts and healthcare and public health. So it's a very different moment to be a part of. Um, and just a few examples of that, I mentioned the World Health Organization. Um, they have for the past five years or so, Christopher Bailey is the arts and health lead at the World Health Organization and is driving arts and health activations all over the world. Um, we were in Cairo two weeks ago for one. There's one upcoming in Abu Dhabi. I mean, there's just things happening all over the world. Um, and the World Health Organization has created the Jamil Arts and Health Lab, which is a dedicated lab for exploring the relationships between the arts and health and advancing research in that space. The NIH here in the United States, of course, you all know the NIH, the largest healthcare funder in the United States, um, also has its own initiatives that have been ongoing for a number of years now. Sound Health is a program that funds um, research on music in the brain in particular. Which is co co-based at UCSF. It is, that's right. You've got mm -hmm. the Sound Health Network here at UF, mm -hmm. at UCSF with Julian Johnson and amazing folks. I think you heard from mm -hmm. Susan Mag Salmon from mm -hmm. the Neuro Arts Blueprint. That's another national initiative that's centered in your domain, looking at the, the relationships between the arts and neuro neurology, right? Mm -hmm. So looking at the impacts of the arts on the brain. Um, the CDC has also joined the party. I was uh, appointed as a senior advisor to the CDC during the pandemic on the vaccine task force confidence and demand team, uh, because the CDC recognized that if you're going to mount a national communication strategy, you can't do it without artists and music and drama um, and dance and those sorts of things. So um, they partnered with the National Association of Museums and Libraries, and together the CDC Foundation and that organization gave 130 grants to artists and arts organizations to drive vaccine confidence in the United States. A report just came out about a month ago on that. Um, and I'll talk about One Nation, One Project today, which is another national initiative in the United States that's advancing this work. So why are these leaders in health globally, nationally, um, driving uptake of the arts? Now we have a lot of evidence, right? Not only does it make sense as us to human beings, because we know, I mean, how many of us like dose ourselves with music? Mm -hmm. I wear my earbuds all the time and throughout the day, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we as humans, many of us recognize the value of the arts to our well being, right, and our health. Um, but now we have evidence that can look at even more granular levels and help us to understand, like, how the arts can actually reduce pain, right? Mm -hmm. The perception of pain and the need for opioids, those sorts of things. Um, so we've got really compelling uh, evidence in a number of areas. When we look at population level health, we've got a ton of compelling evidence that shows in particular, and these are studies that have been replicated in the UK, Dr. Daisy Fancourt at UCL leads a lot of this work. They've been replicated now in our lab in the US, um, but there's a strong relationship statistically at the population level between arts participation and depression and mental health. So for example, people over the age of 50 who go to museums or galleries or concerts, right? And that's not just big concert halls, that's like your church choir and local festivals just once a month or more are 48% less likely to be depressed, right? This is a UK sp a statistic specifically. I'll share some US stats with you in a few minutes. Oops, my cursor, there we go. Um, there have been a lot of studies I mentioned when I started um, how the arts are essential to our survival as a species, right? The work of Ellen DeSaniaco, who's an amazing bioanthropologist. And there have been now national level studies in several Scandinavian countries, the UK, the US, and other countries that show that people who participate again just once a month or more in arts and cultural activities are between 14 and 33% less likely to die early 
right? And these studies are highly controlled for all the things you would think, ec economic, socioeconomic status, education, gender, race, those sorts of things. And they hold up across demographic groups and they point largely to the, to the immune response of arts engagement as one of the primary mechanisms of play. Um, so this is really important work that helps us understand how the import, important the arts are to our health. One of our studies has shown that um, people who participate in the arts, again, just once a month or more, are 80% more likely to have healthy aging. And this is an unadjusted statistic, by the way. We've done some, some other statistical work that sort of mitigates this significantly, but at the unadjusted level, an 80% association. And so healthy aging, meaning the absence of a chronic disease and good cognitive, physical, and mental health. And this extends over time. So people who participate once a month have healthier aging even between two and four years later. Um, so really compelling statistics at the population level. At the individual level, as we're looking at interventions, right, health interventions, the way that health systems are now engaging the arts, we see things like with Parkinson's disease. Have you guys heard of Dance for PD, right? It's a really um, well-known program. So Dance has been shown to have even stronger outcomes than exercise, right? Around things like balance and mobility in particular with Parkinson's disease. So really effective means for addressing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, music and pain have been shown to be related. Music can reduce the perception of pain, reduce the need for opioid medications, right? Reduce the length of stay post-procedure. So a lot of really compelling evidence there. Um, and cardiovascular disease. So with cardiovascular diseases, dance has been shown to have greater effects even than walking. Right, so super practical, right? There's a lot of um, a lot of really compelling evidence in our Epi Arts Lab. This is a National Endowment for the Arts Research Lab at the University of Florida, um, Daisy Fancourt at UCL, and I co-direct this lab. We're building on all this amazing statistical work that Daisy has done over the past 12 years at UCL, applying those statistical models to American longitudinal data sets and finding similar results. Um, we started by looking at who participates in the arts in the United States, and we found that the social gradients that have long existed in arts participation in the U.S. and in other places um, persist. But the better news from our findings is that while those, those gradients very problematically persist around institutional, you know, performing um, cent art centers and big institutions, that um, they're less pronounced with things like community-based and home-based creative activities, right? And there's, you know, gender disparities there as well or differences. So we've been looking across the lifespan and we've, we've got some really interesting findings, especially among young people and older adults. And as we've looked at the relationships between arts participation and health outcomes with young people in particular, we've found significant associations with social support and loneliness. And I imagine you all have seen, those of you who are based in the US at least have seen the Surgeon General's report of a couple of months ago on loneliness. Yes. I hope you've seen it. It's, yeah, it's it. a very important mm -hmm. report. Um, underscoring evidence that's been around for a while in the US that um, there's huge physical health risks associated with loneliness. Loneliness is a huge determinant of health, especially for cardiovascular disease and NCDs. And in fact, we found that loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day as a health risk, right? Um, so loneliness is a super important health concern right now. The issue of social cohesion in general. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So in our studies, we've been looking a lot in that area, and we've found that among young people doing one or more school-based arts activities associated with 59% odds of social support, of high social support concurrently, and 28% um, higher odds of social support a year later. So there's a very strong correlation between engaging in the arts in school and social support. 
Um, we've also looked at relationships between arts participation and flourishing in young people. And what you can see here is a dose response relationship. So a number of our studies show relationships between how often you participate in the arts. The, the statistics I cited for older adults are once a month or more. You can see that among young people, the more they participate in the arts, the stronger the effect, right? So there's a clear dose re response relationship. And here you can see the breakdown between emotional, um, psychological, and social well being, with the biggest effects being around social well being. Again, super important in terms of what we know about loneliness. Jill, can yeah. you go back, please? I will. Um, can you explain what you mean by emotional, psychological, and social well being? Uh, yeah, so these are measures. So in these studies, we use existing um, data sets. So this, this one in particular look, uses the income dynamics um, transition into adult supplement of the, which one is this? Um, this is the uh, panel study of income dynamics, right? So it's a particular data set, longitudinal data set. And so all of these studies are based on the questions asked in those surveys. So they're asking about emotional well-being, psychological well-being, and social well-being as three domains of well-being in, in that survey. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're also looking at what we call reportedly antisocial, antisocialized and um, antisocial and criminalized behaviors. And this is our changing of the word um, delinquent, right? We reject the notion of delinquency and the label of delinquent among young people because we recognize that many of the behaviors that are considered delinquent among people are not maladaptive, but they're adaptive, right? Especially in relation to trauma in the home and um, you know other, other significant stressors in the home. Um, but we did use delinquency data, right, in the United States in these longitudinal data sets. And we found, again, clear relationships between arts participation and reductions in reportedly antisocial and criminalized behaviors. And the mechanisms involved there are perceptions of those behaviors and self-control primarily. And we see these associations holding up across two years. So this is an important part of the lifespan in which kids are establishing behaviors for themselves. They're also establishing identities. And when they're labeled as delinquent or when they enter into the legal system, it's a significant setup for health in later life, right? So we recognize the importance of, of that relationship and of access to arts at this stage in life. Among older adults, I showed you the UK statistic of 48% of um, lower depression risk. In the United States, that's about 20%. And again, we think this is a lot about those disparities in who's accessing the arts and less support in general and access to the arts in this country. But again, strong relationships between arts and creative engagement. Um, and I shared this statistic already, the 80% the from this study. So from all of this work, we assert that arts participation is a health behavior, right? Like wearing a seatbelt, exercising, eating well, being creative and engaging in the arts is a health behavior because we know that those who do have better health outcomes in a number of areas, right? And a lot of areas, that's just the tip of the iceberg, the things that I've shared with you today. Um, we also believe based on those disparities that persist in who participates in the arts, that access to the arts is a social determinant of health, right? Because those who have access have better health outcomes, have more opportunities for better health. Um, so we're really in our work looking at the, the issues of access to the arts. Excuse me, can I ask something? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, when you talk about, like, I would like to be a little bit more clear about the, dif the difference between the emotional and psychological well-being. Like, maybe can you give an example of the questions you were asking and like the emotional and the psychological? Yeah. 
That's a great question, Laura. Thank you for that. And unfortunately, I don't know every, we use seven longitudinal data sets and they're full of many, many questions. And I don't remember all of those questions by heart. So I apologize. Um, I would have to look myself back at that. Laura, I can help you with that. We can look at that later. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you. Oh, Sorry, thank I can't you. answer it. <laughs> So um, yes, sorry, the I heard other thing that our work tells down. us Double and that we uh, uh, sorry, yes, my question was also very similar to Laura's. Uh, how are those 12 being measured? Like not precisely the difference in between one or the other, but what are the questions or what are the indicators or what are the elements that you are using to say, okay, all those elements give us a clue on how um, well is doing psychologically or emotionally uh, one of the subjects. Sorry, uh, you are mute. Um, Jill, we cannot listen to you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. It jumps around when you're trying to mute. And I was trying to mute Armagon because he and Danny were speaking at the same time. Oh. And so <laughs> I muted us oh. in the process. Sorry. Okay. And now you okay. can hear us, Danny. Yeah, thank you. Great, absolutely. Again, these are not scales that we've originated. Um, we use seven longitudinal big data sets in the United States. And so I don't know all of the questions of those surveys by heart, right? I'm, I'm sort of dealing with our UCL partners do those statistical analyses. So um, with apologies, I can't answer the question. I don't know the questions in those surveys well enough. No, but um, okay, not all, also not well enough by heart on every detail, but more or less an idea or what is asked or not, also not. I mean, not a, not even a general idea. The differences between psychological well being and emotional well being? No, in general, how is well being oh. measured? Oh, how is well being measured? So, again, differently in these different scales right, in the, in the different surveys that are used. So um, again, this isn't one measure that we've originated in other areas of our work we have, and we use things like the WHO5, um, but across these surveys, there, there are different well-being questions. And again, I, I'd have to pull up those surveys to be clear and specific around that, I apologize. But we generally in the lab, we use um, WHO and CDC and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, primarily Robert Wood Johnson Foundation definitions of well being, very holistic definitions of well being. But we're bound to the questions in these surveys. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I know it doesn't fully. Yeah, okay, it's a guidance. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so again, we, we consider in all of this research that the arts are uniquely multimodal activities, right? Among other health interventions, the arts can have social, cognitive, physical, emotional, and behavioral impacts all at the same time, right? And that's unique among health interventions. So in that way, they're very practical, right? They're, they're multimodal. They're generally appealing. A lot of people like them, not everyone, but a lot of people enjoy engaging in the arts. Compared to other med medical interventions, they're low risk, right? And they're low cost. So there's a lot of practical reasons for this broad uptake of the arts and health today. And we see that panning out in evidence-based clinical interventions. We were in Copenhagen last week looking at the music and motherhood intervention and the World Health Organization is working to scale that globally because it increases social support, reduces postpartum depression and depression. So we see a lot of those evidence-based interventions. We also just see a lot of practice. There are arts programs in at least half of hospitals in the United States right now. 
Um, so we see a prevalence of practice in public health. We see more uptake in the arts for prevention, for management in health communication, like the CDC example I provided. And we're seeing this new landscape of social prescribing. Have any of you been engaged with social prescribing work? A few people, yeah. Great. Um, so social prescribing is a systems approach that's being implemented in different parts of the world, most notably the UK, where as a health system, the NHS, the NHS funds a few thousand link workers who are a part of the health system and facilitate social prescribing for patients. So it's a system wherein care providers can prescribe or refer patients to social community-based, very local, community-based, social, nature, arts, culture, volunteering opportunities to address those, a lot of those social determinants of health and to fill the gap in healthcare where so many people present to the healthcare system just not thriving, right? Not doing great. And often there's low levels of you know, mental health concerns there or often loneliness, right? And these scenarios don't need the big, big high-risk guns, high-cost guns of medicine, right? But healthcare providers often don't have in their toolkit the ability to prescribe or refer to the things that are needed in that moment, right? They know what their payers, at least in the United States, will pay for, and that's what they can offer. So social prescribing fills that gap and allows a, a physician to recognize that loneliness or low levels of mental health might be at play, right? And to refer that patient to the link worker who can then sit with the patient with more time and say, what matters to you, right? What do you need? What do you want? What are you interested in? And knows the landscape of the community and says, there's a walking group I think you should join, or I think you should volunteer at the library, or you should take, take a dance class. Let's hook you up with that. So that system exists in at least 28 countries in the world right now. And we're tracking about 30 pilots in the United States. They're paid for in different ways at this point, right? They're structured differently, but ultimately this is a system, systems alignment approach that extends the system of care from the healthcare system more deeply into the community and engages available hyper-local community-based social arts, nature, culture resources. Yeah. I think I saw that experience in the UK. Yeah. Where the migrant population like in Birmingham. Yep. I work with the Somali community oh, yeah. in Birmingham. There's a big program there. Yeah. And uh, they use these techniques, right. particularly for the NHS funded mental health right. services. Yep. Mm. That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. So it's in the UK. It's very well established in yeah. the UK. It's been yes. around for more than a decade in the UK. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, even in the US, there are social prescribing programs, but they're focused very much on so the social determinants, things like housing, food, transportation. And so we just need to broaden, right? That, that notion of social determinants of health. Um, I'm gonna just talk about One Nation, One Project for a minute, and then we'll open it up to dialogue. Any questions before I transition to this final example? Um, so thank you for the very informative uh, presentation so far. My question is, uh, yes, we have the evidences that uh, arts, music can, are really beneficial to further heads. And uh, I can see that the link here or in, in some of the setups from the science side, uh, but I was trying to, to think of my own setup and uh, it could be easier for, for scientists, for healthcare professionals, for us to convince that we really need art, music in, into the care of the patients. But I, I couldn't really be sure about the reception from the art side, especially mm -hmm. the skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I've been involved in a project with an NGO to involve music therapy and art therapy in our, in our uh, practice for refugees. And we, could, we couldn't find any artist that, that has the idea to make the, the connections with, with psychosocial support. And so how, how do you see that in, in, in some setups? That's a really good question. So there's a lot to say here. Um, and one, one of the things is that you know, artists have 
always worked to address health and well-being, right, and equity and, and these sorts of things that the public health system is really concerned with. They've done so in very organic ways, um, but without, you know, specific training, as you mentioned, increasingly in the past 30 years, there are more opportunities for that kind of training for artists as the field of arts and health is better established. I love that you mentioned the creative arts therapies, right? They've been around since the 1930s, right? Working as clinicians to bring the arts to bear in these ways. In, in what we call the field of arts and health, um, we're mostly talking about artists who bring the arts to bear for all sorts of reasons. And in that continuum, we think of sort of a clinic to community continuum where creative arts therapists are highly trained. There are artists who are highly trained to work in hospitals and to do outreach from hospitals, things like dance for PD, right? And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's artists in the arts just doing what the artists, what the arts and artists do. And as people come, they, they derive health benefits, right? So not without a lot of training, but there's a big part of that spectrum does include training. And there's more and more of that training available here. I believe that as social prescribing and you know, big game changers like that happen in the United States in particular, and the general population's awareness of the, under, of, of the relationship between the arts and health grows. So just like Sunday night, you're thinking about your week, you're like, okay, when am I gonna exercise this week? Because that's important. Will, you, will we also think, okay, when am I going to be creative this week, right? And where am I going to do it? I'm going to catch that dance class over here. I'm going to go to the concert over here. So we create a landscape in which there's more demand for what artists do. There's more demand for the specific health-oriented things like Dance for PD. And there's just more demand for more opportunities to participate. Mm -hmm. Good question, thank you. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I could uh, chime in. Uh, I, I just, yeah, I think, yeah, just to piggyback on what Binyam is, is saying, I have a question for you is, can you speak to uh, equity? Because, uh, you know, equity is a big part of our work. Uh, can you speak to equity in the sense of what you guys are doing to, to diversify and create sustainable opportunities for professional artists within this emergent field? Um, I think that, you know, it seems like if the value of the art is and the artist is as what you what you say it is, you know, I, I think the medical community has the sustainable fact that, you know, obviously doctors get to work at hospitals. Artists tend to be gig workers, which, as you know, is a very volatile uh, existence for most uh, for most artists. So how do you address that so that the work is sustainable uh, and the artist can really participate in the economy of the work? Uh, and not just sort of be on, on the fringes, kind of being, you know, kind of being used for their artistic prowess. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So um, Patrick Smith, who is a bioethicist at Duke University, he and I have an article coming out really soon. It's, it's in production. It should be out anytime on the ethics of engaging artists in public health work um, where we address a lot of that. Um, but there's a, a lot to touch on here, Eric. And um, one of the, the things that I am sort of pushing hard on in the discussions around social prescribing is that in the United States with third party payers, right, insurance companies, um, hopefully social prescribing in the United States will include something like insurance companies like Blue Cross Blue Shield, Medicaid, Medicare, CMS, those agencies actually providing money to pay for the dance classes and the, you know, all, all those other sorts of interventions. Um, but my fear there, and we have a lot of dialogue around how do we in social prescribing not create another racist healthcare system, right? We know that people who are insured, um, you know, have access to wellness and prevention, people who are uninsured or underinsured don't. And that's, you know, where we really need to address this kind of work. Um, so part of what I'm pushing really hard on is that, that at a systems level, we don't create a system through in which funds are channeled to large arts and cultural institutions, right? Where there's barriers, lack of welcome, you know, a lot of all those disparities we know about, you know? Um, so how do we get those, the money 
literally from Blue Cross Blue Shield to the amazing quilter who lives three blocks over there, you know, who wants to welcome people to her home every week mm -hmm. to quilt, right? Um, so we've been working on that in the New Jersey pilot. New, in New Jersey, there's a regional social prescribing pilot in Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield is the primary partner. And so the New Jersey Performing Arts Center is the other primary partner. And they've been creating a network of local artists and arts organizations and arts programs. So really working to make sure that the people who do what they do, right, even if they're not connected with a big program um, can be a part of these systems. Um, so the, again, there's just the recognition that there's tons of arts and cultural resources available in communities and we can't limit access just to the institutions that you know have 501c3s and, and all of those sorts of things. So that's one thing, Eric, that we're thinking about in this, this space of equity. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very sensitive topic because right now in the arts profession, there's a major uh, issue with the record labels and the way art and even in theater, uh, it's, a, it's a major problem in terms of e equity uh, and the arts. And it would be a, a travesty if in this work, artists yeah. continue to get the uh, short end of the stick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, again, one of the driving things is that artists have to be paid, right? Just the, the sort of cultural norming of artists being paid and a, a lot of what we're um, in a number of avenues of our work, including in One Nation, One Project, which I'll finish by talking about, we ensure that community members who participate are paid at the same rate of pay as academics and others, you know, who are, who are coming to the table to participate. So it's that sort of norming of the valuation, recognizing that art and science are the same, artists bring the same level of expertise in time investment in training, Right, there really are not differences that, although we think there are, right, in the sort of hierarchy of disciplines. Right, artists are highly skilled, highly competent, highly professional. They've invested the time, they've invested the money, and they're under highly undervalued, extraordinarily undervalued. So that's a cultural paradigm shift, right? And it's being driven from many directions um, in the United States. Slow and coming but it's being driven. Thank you, Eric, for that question. So let me move quickly through introducing you to One Nation, One Project, and then we can have some more dialogue. So One Nation, One Project is a national initiative. It was born of the pandemic and a moment in the pandemic um, when there was a lot of recognition that the social fabrics of our communities, of course, were broken by social distancing, right? And so many other dimensions of the pandemic. So Lear de Bessonet, who's one of the three co-artistic directors of this initiative, along with Clyde Ballantine and Nataki Garrett, um, Lear, and others in the United States started thinking, we need a new WPA, right? It's time for a new Works Progress Act, which was after the Great Depression, when again, we were broken. That was the last time when we were so universally broken in the United States. The government made unprecedented investment in the arts to rebuild social fabrics, to create jobs and physical infrastructures like theaters, right? And to bring people together around creativity, narrative storytelling. So this One Nation, One Project initiative asks what would happen, right, if the health, public health, arts and culture and municipal government sectors came together, if, if artists were brought to that table of innovators, problem solvers, you know, around these big questions, like how are we gonna recover and heal from this pandemic? Um, so that is what ha has happened. And in fact, we build on, on the WPA and one dimension of it, which was the federal theater project. There were federal dance projects and poetry and all the arts had projects. But in the federal theater project, 18 cities in the United States all mounted the same play on the same night, but in their own way. Right? It was a play called It Couldn't Happen Here, which is about the fear of the rise of fascism. And so different communities approached it in different ways with different art forms with different artists, with different narratives about racism and about other issues in their communities. They premiered on the same night. And so it was 
uh, sort of this quilt of local narratives that became a national narrative and a national spectacle. So One Nation, One Project seeks to do that. And on the same night, July 27, 2024, 18 cities, including Oakland, California, will culminate two years of creative work, two years of providing as much opportunity for arts engagement as possible in communities and the co-creation of performances and festivals and different things, not just theater, but different art forms will all culminate. So we'll have 18 local narratives focused on different issues that will culminate as a national spectacle on July 27. So these are our 18 cities. Again, Oakland is here. You can see we've got two Hawaiian communities also in the West and communities across the country. And you can see tiny communities like Utica, Mississippi with 850 residents, right? To the city of Chicago and the Bronx in New York. So these are very different cities across the United States all addressing different issues. They all came to the project for different reasons. In Phillips County, Arkansas, there is a profound lack of access to clean water. Many residents have to boil water for every use in the household. And so they're using storytelling. They're collecting the narratives and the stories of community members and their, their relationship to water and telling those stories in order to create awareness and advocacy and to organize toward a clean water infrastructure and they'll host a water festival on July 27. The city of Chicago is focusing on mental health and they're doing something that a few of our communities are doing, which is uh, onboarding artists as community health workers. They've hired 10, they're fully salaried. They're getting a year of training. They'll each be embedded in a local clinic community health center and clinic, and they'll also engage social prescribing, right? Um, and they'll create this artist workforce. They'll, they'll also be community health workers, right? But they're artists, so they'll bring their art into that, into that process. Gainesville, Florida is focused where Aaron came right to you from, um, is focusing on gun violence and youth mental health. They've made uh, two rounds, or just, I think they're just adjudicating the second round of grants now um, to artists. So they did this fabulous thing of saying, we're not going to come up with one idea as a central team. We're just going to provide opportunities for all the artists in our community to have their own ideas and do their own things. So we'll have a community full of arts activities at the really hyper local level. Um, and so they've they've had their first showcase after the first round of grants and they'll have their second on July 27. It's really, really cool what these artists are doing here in Oakland. The focus is on wellness, racism, anti-blackness and, and houselessness. And um, the festival this Saturday, I hope you'll come to the Life is Living Festival in West Oakland. That's a festival that's been ongoing for a number of years, but this year it becomes an arts and wellness festival. Instead of having a wellness area, the whole festival is wellness. Um, so I hope you'll come out to that and that festival um, will, will repeat along with other activities in Oakland. So that's the location and the time, 10 to six on Saturday. So One Nation One Project leverages uh, public and private funds. So we raised $11.5 million to support the project and each community, um, not all, but many of the communities are leveraging American Rescue Plan Act funds. So like the WPA, leveraging those unprecedented investments in community for rebuilding post, post pandemic. We've just mounted a major communications campaign called Arts for Everybody. So you'll see it in social media, in the news, the New York Times has picked up on it. So communications, again, cultivating that awareness of the relationship between the arts and health is really important to us. So this project seeks to activate collaboration across sectors and among community members to amplify local narratives, right, of health and well-being, to advance health equity by engaging the arts and access to the arts, um, and to achieve true transformation. So it's the norm, right? Next time there's an emergency, we're not thinking of the artists a little later, right? Artists are immediately at the table for problem solving and for innovation. So just a bit about research. This is a major research undertaking, as Aaron knows well, because he's been a part of this. Um, we are testing the theory of change that was developed through the WeMaking 
initiative, another national initiative that, that says that community-based arts participation enhances the drivers of social cohesion. So enhances social cohesion and in turn advances equitable community health well-being or community well-being. And so we're testing that theory of change across our 18 cities with 18 paired control cities as well. And we've got a major mixed methods study um, that is driven by very clear values and commitments. Um, Eric, in alignment with your question, we came to this project with a major commitment, not just to not do harm as researchers, which researchers have done so much of, you know, with the extractive nature of research in the United States and in other places, but to really move the needle, at least a little, in demonstrating how, you know, so, so for example, we're committed to not saying at the end of any of our publications, we were limited by this, our demographics weren't this, and future researchers should do better, right? But rather to say how we did better in this project. So we're, we're really committed to advancing equity, not just status quo, but advancing equity through our actions and being visible in those ways. We're in, uh, committed to inclusion and multicultural validity, understanding differences in, in culture across communities um, and engaging people. And in fact, so far in our research, all of our demographics are far more diverse than the population of the United States. So we've been very successful at engaging voices that are not often heard um, in research. Um, we've created what we call local map makers groups, which is a one up of the community advisory board in community based participatory research. So we funded those groups. So everyone again is paid. They set their own rate of pay. They can use their money for childcare, transportation, food, pay themselves more, whatever they want. We pay a point person um, as well in those groups and they tell us what is data in their communities, what information is meaningful, right? They tell us how we could get that data, how, what ways are appropriate for us to get that data. When they want to collect it, we train them and pay them to collect it themselves, right? Or they tell us how to do it. Um, so they're not just advisors, but they really drive our methods, our design, and everything that we do in the research space. They meet at least two hours a month through the life of the project. Um, local ownership of data is critical to us. We give our data back immediately. Um, is, you know, we have a two month window for analysis and reporting and giving back to the communities on every stage of our data collection. Um, and we're creating local data repositories for each community. So they'll have all of their raw data, all of their analyses, all of the reports so they can leverage that to have control as researchers come to them in the future. Um, and so building that capacity, that power is really important to us. So we're testing that theory of change in a, whoops, I'm gonna go backwards there, in a very complex, and this is the really friendly, simple <laughs> model of this very, I, ca I can't at this stage count the number of studies that, that are a part of this big research agenda, but it involves both qualitative and qualitative methods. And in essence, there are four primary parts. Um, our foundational studies, Erin is involved in our integrative review, which is still ongoing. And we published, we developed through a year long study and published a new definition for arts participation that is more inclusive than those that have existed uh, previously for public health re research. This is kind of the heart of our research agenda. We developed an original survey, again, took a year to do a study and tested national and original survey that collects data related to arts participation, um, social cohesion and well-being, and people's perceptions of the relationships between those things. Um, we've just finished our first round of data collection. So in all 18 communities, and we're now in our comparison cities now, we've conducted seven focus groups thus far. We'll, we'll do between 20 and 30 of those. And those are samples of general populations. Then we developed an original survey to just three questions plus demographics for people who participate. We've developed a beautiful app that aestheticizes the process of surveying that we're super excited about. That's a partnership with Stanford University. And we use participatory murals to, to collect data as well. 
Mm -hmm. um, we're doing unique health outcome studies in a number of our communities. That was an option for our communities. And a number of our communities are doing social prescribing st uh, st programs. So we're extending the work of the, at the arts lab, which includes social prescribing implementation science studies. And we're studying the social prescribing programs in One Nation, One Project. Um, so we're really lifting up community narratives. We're using a ton of arts-based methods. Um, we are engaging partnership between the ONUP research team, our map makers and community members, and through those map makers groups and local uh, data repositories really working to again expand lo local research capacity so those communities can ask and answer their own questions more effectively after this project wraps up. That's a lot of words. I talked longer than I planned, so I'm going to stop there. It was very um, formative. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I learned it a lot. Good. 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 Thank you. Well, I welcome comments or questions, discussion. And you know, if we take down the slides, and then I can ask those online that want to put their their videos on. It now is more of a community of participants there. That's Perfect. great. And then it's easier for them to ask questions if they want to. I'm going to turn off our cell phone. I want to say something, actually. Uh, first of all, thank you for paving this way for uh, us. Like we're, I mean, I'm personally starting this road very newly. And uh, in my country, it hasn't evolved yet as it is here. But uh, I mean, it's uh, thank you for basically creating this um, path for us. I'm very overwhelmed with what you said. I mean, it's uh, very interesting and things were popping up in my mind. So it might be, I might be slightly incoherent right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking of uh, ways to uh, creating space and knowledge for art, basically kind of reducing the distance people feel towards things that they see in museums or in concerts. Like there's this intellectual sophisticated distance, like to bring it to more uh, accessible level and also uses of this in public health. And one of the questions that I was kind of, uh, one of the things that I felt that people were experiencing is, I work in music. And uh, when I was thinking about knowledge about music, how it would actually enhance our, not only understanding, but pleasure, like hugely, I felt a slight um, what do you say, hesitation in people that knowing more about music would maybe reduce their yeah, feelings yeah, yeah. Uh, because yeah. it, they might become more analytical uh -huh. towards it and kind of lose the joy, yeah. which I don't agree, but I can see that might be one of the things like uh, that kind of stands in the way of making art more accessible, this idea yeah. of, I find in my personal view, your tastes might change. It's, mm -hmm. it's like trying new things and then, yes, you might not enjoy the music maybe that much and you might enjoy something else, but being open, like uh, as long as you're being open to that, I believe uh, it doesn't have any hindering effect of taking pleasure, but I'm kind of looking more convincing uh, data than my belief, mm -hmm. uh, like mm -hmm. to talk about this issue. Uh, because uh, talking about music and explaining its emotional effects, uh, that's something I do. And I believe people, um, it, it helps people, but I kind of need a little bit more, um, I, I don't want to say data, but more supporting arguments for this. Yeah. And I would like to understand what it does to our body, like in our brain, or you know how specifically it would change people's behavior. Like, First of all, I wanted to ask, like, there's a huge literature that I don't know. So I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you about this kind of literature that I would like to read and check. And um, that's one thing. <laughs> and, and the other thing is, um, again, like finding ways to bring art uh, in communities. I was thinking of art interventions, like, um, like bringing these little 10, 15 minute interventions to people's daily life. Like even if in a, even in a UCSF community or GBHI, like it could be um, your structure could be taking material 
directly actually from artists who would be providing this 10, 15 minutes or maybe five minutes short breaks uh, like presentations in their specific topic about very specific things. And this could be like, I was thinking of a system, it could be like Tinder even that you have local people that you can see, like, you know, what's it? <laughs> but it's like people get paid when they enter their material, like when they prepare their presentation and they prepare like that, that they bring their material and they are paid for it. So, but then the public can use it, you know, that payment is done by, I don't know, NH, I, I don't know, the, NH, yeah. or some other yeah. countries' things. Absolutely. And this could be something that would, uh, that you can access the local artist, you can also see who is around you, and you can also buy their material. Mm -hmm. And this could be something, you know, as a, mm -hmm. let's say, on a corporate level or academic level, uh, you know, giving people options to use this, um, choose their, interest and interventions, mm -hmm. like something in that sense, like systematizing yeah. something like that. Mm -hmm. So awesome. So this is the kind of innovation that I think we'll see burgeoning as um, social prescribing and other, maybe one nation one project, you know, if our communications campaign is effective and if social prescribing, like there's a Medicaid waiver coming this summer and the Federal Reserve Bank, for example, is interested in how we can catch that wave and really get social prescribing implemented in the United States. So as things like that happen. Well, I'm the Federal Reserve Bank. <laughs> yeah, um, they hosted an event last week in New York on social prescribing. Um, so as those sorts of things happen and the, the awareness among the general public of the relationships between the arts, you know, heightens and that is a paradigm shift. Like when we think about public health, in the United States and probably in other parts of the world, there, there are moment, there are game changer moments like seatbelts and smoking and nutrition, right? Those are game changing, population health changing moments. Could social prescribing, arts and health, you know, have a moment like that coming, right? And if that happens, to some extent at least, I think we'll see an incredible explosion of innovation around the kinds of things that you're describing. Programs, systems, apps, you know, that help connect people to the arts as a health resource, right? To one another and to opportunities around their community. So I think there will be great space for that. There's already an incredible um, program called Art Pharmacy, a for-profit business that's been built out of Atlanta and a guy named Chris Appleton put it together. They're now providing the link worker um, function and infrastructure for making referrals and reporting back to healthcare systems and evaluating. So that's an, a business innovation that's emerged already and is doing quite well. Health systems buy into that. Um, I just want to touch on a couple other things. So um, one, there is a ton of data to access, as you know. We host an arts and health research database on the Center for Arts and Medicine website, so you can use that as a resource. There, uh, Sound Health has a database as well, and it's the Sound the Health one? Network, the Center for Arts and Medicine, Arts and Health Research Database. So I can show you that. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, Sound Health Network also has a resource there. Um, and in terms of the very beginning, you were talking about, um, you know, what counts, I think, in this space. And that's why we created a new definition so that there's recognition that when we talk about the arts as an intervention, it's not just high art, right? It's all the creative things we do. Like, you all did an amazing job of choosing your outfits this morning, right? I mean, you know, we are creative in a lot of ways in our lives, right? The time we spent, you know, gardening and putting meals on the table and reading for pleasure. There are things that we, we um, don't acknowledge as having benefits to our health, you know, in those ways. So, so broadening that recognition, creating access and the dose response relationships. One thing I, I talked about kids, the more young people participate, the better. We find an older population, sometimes there's a, you know, benefits at once a month, more benefits at once a week or a couple times a week, but reduced benefits in every day. And that may be in relation to what you were talking about. Like, when does it become work? 
and when does our relationship to an art form change potentially and become work? So we we need to do more study there, but we we do see indications that it could you know change at the daily level for some people. Yes. Unless there's a hand up. I, there were a couple things on chat. One was Tinder Art, which was the name of it for, for, from Elisabetta. And I like the idea of stop and draw. We could just do five minutes, just stop and draw in the in the in the in the office. Yeah, we have three questions on Zoom. Yeah. So well, Umesh is first. Thank you, Zil, for the presentation. It's really helpful. I have like a simple question. Are you talking about this? Uh, isolation like loneliness is like uh, smoking like fifteen cigarettes per day so i think uh, i wanted to ask you what is the definition of loneliness and and what is related to this introvert because some people are introverts so is introvert so much Umesh, I'm going to have to interrupt you. Can you turn off your video? Because we're just not getting the sound or maybe type your question in the chat or type your question in the chat uh, okay uh, can you hear now it's a little better yeah. yeah why don't you try okay i wanted to ask you like what is the definition of loneliness and is it subjective or objective because some people like many people are introverts so it's introvert is equal to loneliness or they like living alone staying alone and they recharge when they are lonely so uh, like how do you define so is it subject or objective or uh, can you like say some idea about it and i have a follow-up question okay umesh umesh we're really not getting it but i think we got the first part of it mm -hmm. so it is how do you define loneliness because there's a big difference between introverts and extroverts and what that time alone is spent. yeah there's not one universally accepted definition of loneliness right now um in fact i'll mention jeremy nobel who's in a Incredible person in this field just published a book. Um, I think it came out about 10 days ago called The Unlonely Project. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really great resource right now. But anyway, it, it, people define loneliness differently from um, the difference between the, the social, the connections that you want and that you have, right? Um, some people talk about loneliness as a sense of not having a place you belong, right? You could, mm -hmm. you could be in a crowded room and not feel you belong there. So it's not about the number of people around you or the you know, volume of connection. Um, but there are different definitions for loneliness out there. And Aaron is, yeah. has some information that he'll share with you. I think for me personally, a clean one is perceived social isolation. And the perception piece is key because everybody perceives differently. Yeah, so that, that difference between what you have and what you want, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. We have a, a few more, Laura. 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 Hi. So uh, I am a teaching artist and I've been working in refugee camps for the last eight years doing community music workshops. And one of the biggest challenges were to find people, artists that were working with the communities. I visited more than 36 refugee camps and there were no one doing music. First, because there is no money, but also because artists were not trained in their conservatories or anything like that to work with the communities. So is there any kind of initiatives or um, like where artists can also develop these tools to work with the communities because I think there is a big gap. Like there, are, like there are very few. And also for me, like to find training, it was very limited. They were not, and the funding is like I was six years without any payment. So it's like how we can, like engage all also artists and uh, institutions like uh, working with music or with dance. Uh, to come directly to the to the communities and uh, to try working in different different settings like corporations also like we were talking like as as students or uh, professors employees we need a space during the day at least to stretch and to put some music breathe together so it's it's like we we talk a lot about this but at the end of the day we don't do it to ourselves, right? So 
Yeah, so there, there are a number of training programs around. Again, at the Center for Arts and Medicine, we've offered for 23 years an annual summer intensive, and we've got graduate and undergraduate programs. There's more and more academic programs. Um, there are more programs around the world, you know, to sort of shorter term, like a week or two week or online. There's even a few online arts and health programs now. And the New Jersey Performing Arts Center is right now beginning the development of a set of online modules for artists to work in community, more about what you're referring to, Laura. So I think it's probably about a year away from launch, but I think that'll be a really um, important innovation for training because artists will be able to sort of log on and grab the modules that they want, you know, and, and access them anytime in an open source format as well as resources like research and practice models. Um, there's a few organizations like in the United States, the National Organization for Arts and Health. Um, they've got a core curriculum for, for artists to work in healthcare that's available as a book. They've also got ethics and standards of practice. So there are resources like those available. Um, but again, I think if, if these tipping points, you know, that are possible come to bear, I think we'll see a, a quickly growing landscape of training opportunities. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, my question was, uh, thank you first for all the inspirational uh, talk that you gave, all the examples, uh, all the way that you've been through. And I was wondering, looks like you don't do that. Cancel. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I was wondering which possibilities of getting to know more about the work you've done, what collaborations could be done, what um, maybe just not to reinvent the wheel. I mean, if you have some experience, some good or bad experience, uh, what was useful for working in several in different communities or which approach um, I was also working in, in I'm, in, I'm a musician um, and I was working also to improve uh, emotional health um, through music. And yeah, I would like to know which are the best experiences in that or what can be, that's that's why I asked about how are you measuring well-being or yeah, or what uh, different experiences can be replied in different types of arts, um, also with different publics. Um, yeah, if I understand your question, are you asking about do you want to know about measurement here or more? No, I'm sorry, no. You... yeah, sorry, it was not a very clear question, a specific answer that I was looking for. More like, okay, how can we get to know more about what you are doing and what possibilities of um, learning or working together or doing um, things uh, exist? Okay, thank you. Um, so our website has loads and loads of stuff. Um, we've published white papers and resources. We just released an arts on prescription field guide for US communities, for instance. That's a 120 pages of how to, how to innovate social prescribing in an equitable way in the US. So our website is full of those sorts of resources. And Aaron, um, who's with you now, can help you navigate and get to those things. Um, he also is a great link here. You know, he spent 12 years with us and knows all about what's going on and I think would be really instrumental in making those sorts of connections, Danny, in terms of opportunities to continue to work together. I'll be with you in Dublin in March. Um, in fact, I'll be in Dublin in November and December as well. Um, so if any of you are, I assume all of you, right? A, a, a creative Brain Week. Will you all go to Creative Brain Week in March? Yes. I'm going in yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, I'll be for that there for that. I would also um, note that your counterparts, those of you who are in Dublin and the counterparts to those of you who are here, um, are really working closely with the World Health Organization. Um, and it sounds like there will be like a country ask for support for arts and health to the WHO, you know, in the works and things like that. So um, I think the WHO link is particularly strong from your Dublin campus. So I would watch that space as well and be in touch with um, Brian Lawler, Dominic Campbell, those folks um, in your in your Dublin spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Eric. 
Uh, hi, Jill. Uh, the work that you're doing is extremely impressive. I mean, it actually gets me very excited to know about all the, the work that you're doing um, and the ways in which this field is evolving. Um, I thank you for mentioning also art pharmacy because I'm very, you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm very interested in the enterprise side of things. I think um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, and um, I wanted to ask if you consult because um, part of one of the projects I'm very passionate about is, cre is, is leveraging brain capital and expertise cross uh, disciplinarily uh, and, you know, being uh, a liaison between multi, um, you know, uh, multidisciplinary teams of neural arts and neural science to actually be on projects to further this work. So it's an aggregation of talent idea as a uh, for-profit uh, enterprise that also helps to create sustainability within this ecosystem. And so just wanted to see if that was something that you consult about and, and maybe down the road I can have conversations, but uh, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I, I, I generally do. And I would be happy to hear from you. Um, you know, it's all just a matter of, of time and capacity, but even if I'm not fully available for what you're looking for, can certainly connect you to the right, to the right folks, right? So yeah, we'll be very happy to hear from you. I love I love the, the way you're thinking. And I just put the art pharmacy link. I think that's the right link um, in the chat. Thank you. So uh, I, have a, I have a suggestion for the remaining kind of 15 minutes-ish. In planning for today, the four of us, um, Camila, Gloria, Mindy, and I, um, <clears throat> we're trying to think about some questions that we could pose in case what just happened for the past half an hour didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you finish your marvelous talk and no one asked a question, right. which wouldn't Zero happen interest. in this group. Yeah. 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 So, so I think a theme from a lot of the questions in the room and on the screen and also in our conversation was kind of like the past 30 years of your life and like the initial, oh my God, look, I'm dancing in the hospital. What am I doing? And the risk that you took to get to where you are today is a huge story that I think a lot of folks can take plug into plug out from and replug and so on. So I'm kind of wondering if, if you'd be willing to share a little bit about how you did that <laughs> and kind of the initial starting point, the conversations that you had with folks to begin with, what that meant from their perspective, how much uh, adaptation you had to endure and continue to endure and what that might mean for, for everyone in the room and on screen, because inevitably people want to replicate that. That's a really big question. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting. I, I'm doing a keynote for an HR conference coming up, and they asked me to talk about the same thing. So it's interesting because I have it. I find reflecting on that a little bit, um, and I think, you know, as like I'm an artist, I came as an artist, and I had my own experiences in my personal life that connected to health. You know, I mean, I was all about aesthetic experience and self-transcendence and transcendence. It's why I danced mm -hmm. for those out-of-body ensemble experiences. And for me, that was like, I, it's like breath, you know, I just needed that to live. And so I had a very deep understanding mm -hmm. of that relationship. And there was at that time, no, really no one to turn to, mm -hmm. right? To explore it. The only thing to do is get in there and, you know, and do the work. So it was, slow going, right? It was very slow going, but in truth, there's a huge correlation between people who pursue the sciences, you know, and like they have arts in their background. Again, art and science are one. So when you speak the right language, you're speaking to the choir as an artist in healthcare. It's really a matter of how you speak that language, right? And I did have to educate myself. I did have to go and get degrees right, um, in order to be accepted, mm -hmm. you know, into those conversations. So that that was a piece, you know, coming with the right mm -hmm. badges, so to speak. Um, but I didn't have them, mm -hmm. you know, when I started that work, for sure. Um, so passion and tenacity, um, you know, are definitely characteristics that were really important. Um, taking the time to demonstrate, because, mm -hmm. you know, 
often if like if we went around the room today, I suspect that many, if not all, would have a moment, right? But in your life that that, that connection is made. Um, so we know as human beings, this is again an old story. Um, so yeah, I was definitely felt like an outsider and I just kept showing up, you know, and um, and I also kept, you know, I, I became a researcher to answer my own curiosity and also because I knew that there there is a way in which this old truth had to learn to be spoken in biomedical language, right? It's like when, do you remember Larry Dassey in the 70s, you know, spiritual, I think he was a doctor as well. He did a study of prayer, like human beings across cultures pray in various forms and in various ways, but like humans have prayed throughout human history. And so he did a study to see if prayer worked, you know, and so he did a Randomized Can you see the name then? D-O-S-S-E-Y, Larry Dossie. He did, you know, controls. He did basically an RCT and there were people who were prayed for and knew it and there were people who were prayed for and didn't oh, know it and there were people who weren't prayed for, right? And it came, it came out just like you would think, you know, like it worked, but the people who knew had, you know, greater effects. So to me, that was kind of like a moment where we, um, utilize stupidly resources and time we don't need to, but but because it's something human beings know, right? And we really shouldn't have to study, but that was really instrumental in the mid 20th century moment where healthcare biomedicine was going from reductionist, reductionist, reductionist to oops, we actually need to think a little more holistically, you know, the placebo effect, all those, all those, the mind body connection that became in the, you know, mid 20th century more, more clear. So that aligned with that time, you know, so I think it is often worth taking the time to, to kind of do the research or do the work of putting what you know into the language of the gatekeepers who you need to join you in order to make the change you want to make. Um, so I think we did a lot of that. We invested a lot of that energy. For those of us interested in the transcript, that was the most important sentence from the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> the takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're all in position to do it right in this incredible institution and your global perspectives collectively are so important in this as well but i also think there's a really important dialogue that goes on over the year because we do have artists and and medical people coming together and they want to learn from each other but there's these scary moments yeah. of i i don't know how to talk to artists i know this works but i don't know how to find them from so there, it's, it is a dialogue that goes on all year, you know, as we work out of our silos and, and have a community to make, make us see it's not so scary to talk to other people. But it's not unlike <laughs> the point that Eric made, right? You know, the, 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 we talked about the devaluation of the arts and of artists, right? It's, you know, there's clear evidence that dancing reduces the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. There's clear evidence now that dancing slows the progression of the disease, mm -hmm. right? This is exactly what physicians are working to do with their patients. Mm -hmm. And exactly, and it's lower cost, it's lower risk, it's high, high adherence, right, mm -hmm. in dance. But one of the big problems is the clinician, you know, who has gone through the systems and been acculturated to the systems, one fears how he or she will be perceived by their peers mm -hmm. if they say, I think you should dance. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, that's not what you went to medical mm -hmm. school for. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we as consumers in the United States, I'm a consumer, we are consumers of healthcare. We have high premiums, high co-pays. Mm -hmm. We wanna get our money's worth. When we're in need, right? When we're experiencing pain and dysfunction and we go to the doctor and we're paying a bunch of money, no matter how well insured we are, you know, typically we've got some, um, you know, some financial investment, you know, I expect the big guns. I'm actually acculturated toward risk and cost, right? 
And when my doctor says, I think you should dance again, do I say, this is not what I came to you for, you know? So there's a, there's social compacts Mm -hmm. that have to change that are all linked to the devaluation and the othering of art Mm -hmm. in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. It's not so the arts are a part of the way we communicate, the way we heal. They're not separate Mm -hmm. in biomedicine. Mm -hmm. They're separate. Mm -hmm. It is also the culture. What we I've, talked with doctors that are in NIH, which are social prescribing, people will go there and now they're, if you told to go dance, they will go dance because it's part of it. Those same doctors go to another country like Ireland Mm -hmm. and people are like, I want a pill. Mm -hmm. So you've got to step into what the culture of that medicine is or change that culture Mm -hmm. itself. But I will also say we, one of the first art sessions, you all had a video on um, dance and Parkinson's disease. And the other piece that comes up again and again, as opposed to taking it, is that community is built. And it's really an important part of these arts classes that isn't happening when we say, go home, because you might fall down and just take these pills. Mm -hmm. And it is, so there's multiple factors coming in there um, that are really important to explore. Um, and I think Aaron has done a lot. Music gets a lot of research. Dance is getting more research. Mm-hmm. But the other arts shouldn't be overlooked mm-hmm. because their time is coming as far as the research. Yes. Right. I want to take a moment to broaden this a little bit. Agath, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Okay, um, so to this, uh, so I'm a neurologist in the memory clinic in Paris. And for the dance, I mean, I think patients are yearning for this. So I've uh, worked a lot with Parkinson. Parkinson and patient living with, uh, with Parkinson's disease. And I think they want it. And I, as the doctor, would like to offer it. Mm-hmm. And we do have, in, the, in my former department, we add those dancing program. And it's clearly established. It's like it changes their motor scheme. Like it's like a direct mm-hmm. uh, lesion effect. Mm-hmm. However, it is the, the barrier I perceive was more like having uh, the like the system to provide that, the train instructors. The, um, so maybe I, I don't feel patient that patients are yearning for pills. I think they want more holistic approach. So my experience would be more, how can I offer it? Do I have the time? Do I have the support? Do I have the possibility? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is clear that, I mean, I, I hope, there is a positive evolution towards clinician understanding that only um, medication response cannot take care of all the symptoms. And so I think it's going maybe into good in European country. I mean, that's the setting I know. So in, I think it's going toward the good direction, but we, we need more, of course. Um, I was wondering if Mata, would, would you be interested also in sharing? Some yeah. Um, so I've been introduced to a, a, a concept that I not, not really thought about until I came here, this, this concept of uh, decolonization of research and, and practice. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a very real thing mm-hmm. where I come from in Zambia because uh, we, for the longest time we have, the direction has been, this is medicine. Medicine is a pill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are African traditions, African medicines, which as a people, as a healthcare provider, I've been told, no, that's not it. You practice medicine this way. You give patients pills, they get better. So even to go back and with, with these ideas, I, I was looking as we were going through this, I just searched, okay, is anyone doing anything? I just typed in art and medicine in Zambia, art and health in Zambia. When you say art in Zambia, it's ART as an anti-retroviral therapy. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the only thing that came up. Uh-huh. So, yeah, yeah, so, same idea. Yeah. So going back and 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 then trying to convince, like you said, first of all, the profession to say, listen, I'm a neurologist, I have a clinic, and I'm prescribing dance to my uh, Parkinson's patients. I will be left out of yeah, the room. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then the patients themselves will be saying, you know, we came to you. Mm-hmm. Because you told us, don't go to the traditional route, uh, where for a long time, art, music, the rituals around medicine were very profound. The traditional healer would be singing as he is treating you. 
which is a part of the treatment. Yeah. And then we've been telling people don't do that. Mm -hmm. And then to change that mindset mm -hmm. is going to take a lot. And bring them together. Yeah. 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 You used an important word. You used decolonization at the beginning of part of your statement. Yeah. Such a critical it's, element. It's, I've never actually thought about it. Um, because it's what is a science, right? Uh, but that now means to say, okay, I need to look at my practice based on things that I have been trained to think that they are not relevant, but they actually are. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reasons why I am probably the last person in the, the health seeking chain, the doctor, the, the white coat doctor is the last person people come to. They will go to the traditional healer. They will go to their pastor, their reverend first, and then somewhere along the road, they say, okay, now let's try the, the white Western water. Medical Even after they see me, if, I, if what I tell them doesn't fit with what they believe, what they think, they'll still go back to what resonates with them. And they're more likely to adhere to what they've been told by this other person that's done to them. Especially if the pill that I'm giving them does not give the results that they're expecting mm -hmm. as quickly as they're expecting them. There was a study in a veterans hospital in Ann Arbor where they were trying to change approaches to medicine and they started with the staff, the administration, the nurses, the doctors. So they started the yoga classes, the meditation, the arts classes there so that it could become more, but I don't know the outcomes of the study. Um, my thing is with, with Mata I was saying with culture in with prayers, uh, with your international experience, uh, because these religious places, these spiritual places have music, which is spiritual. I don't know if you if you had the experience of uh, involving that spiritual or religious music, because I come from a, a very uh, religious community. Uh, have you seen a space where we can tell people, oh, you're singing, but not only to praise your God, but also it's good for your health? Uh, I mean, have you uh, had this experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I've worked in a number of parts of the world, and it's kind of different everywhere in that. I'm really resonating with what, you know, what you're describing. Um, I mean, generally speaking, when we look at indigenous traditional cultures, illness is a spiritual matter. And you know, not not or not just a physical matter, right? So there, um, there is a deep relationship there between the arts, spirituality, and health. You know, and again, biomedicine, that colonial, you know, the colonial ways in which biomedicine have come into many cultures, you know, sort of um, negates or you know pushes away those deep knowledges. But in fact, biomedicine you know, in psychoneuroimmunology and the understanding of the placebo effect lifts up the very same mechanisms that are at play. It's simply the mind-body connection and belief system. What we believe is happening or, or can happen in our bodies can happen in our bodies. Mm -hmm. If we believe we're taking, you know, a pill when we take a placebo, we know that our bodies can affect the same, you know, change. And so those mechanisms, I think, are at play around belief system which is the heart, you know, historically response to illness is cultural response. It's doing the right thing in a cultural context, taking whatever action, you know, individually or collectively. So we're at an interesting moment, you know, globally, and there's variation, there's no way to generalize this, but we're at interesting moments of, which have been going on for decades, you know, for a long time, right? This isn't a special moment. It's been, it's been long in coming. Um, of sort of figuring out what the relationships between those seemingly disparate and in many ways structurally very disparate, dis, disparate systems are and how to reconcile them, right? I don't have an easy answer to that question, um, but as I travel and especially with, you know, in these WHO dialogues where we're starting now in the, with the Global South, we just had the first Global South activation um, two weeks ago in Cairo, those kinds of conversations are building, right? Local artists, local practitioners, you know, are coming into these spaces to, it's interesting to think about this. 
Terror is north of the equator. I'm curious. Yeah, global south is more of an economic term. Than, you know, the global majority or global south is mm -hmm. more of an economic it's, it's and, noon. I just want to make sure that in case you guys have other commitments, Jill. I think we have two more questions, questions. here. Yeah. Um, are you okay to continue? I'm fine. Okay. Um, Umesh, Umesh, would you like to um, ask your question again? Uh, thank you. Uh, regarding Mata's point, I just want one sentence uh, because uh, to involve these faith pillars and everyone, like in Nepal also, we have tried uh, from national level also for the snakes, bites and anything, everything. If we can also include them, the faith pillars and other professionals and community leaders and aware them, I think they can be of great help to the society and they can refer to us and uh, they can uh, like they can know the limit till what they can do and after that what they have to do for the referral. And another point was, I just wanted to share it in a big group regarding loneliness. Uh, we have like our world, this uh, like Eastern world has learned so much from East, uh, Western world. And uh, in the, like Eastern world, we still have this culture of living in a uh, like a combined family, joint family. And they have like the people are not isolated and not lonely. Even, even the family members, parents, grandparents have the support system. So, and I see here in like a Western world, they are alone and at the end, like when they have dementia or they have frailty, again, they seek for their children, they are the primary caregivers. So maybe isn't it the time to rethink about this system that uh, leaving nuclear or maybe risks and like, like benefit ratio, and maybe we can include or we can learn from this Eastern world that the family and this uh, whole family is intact and they, they can like uh, decrease the risk of dementia and other adverse effects. Beautiful. Absolutely, the, the Western world has so much to learn from the Eastern world, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Mesh. Eric? Yeah, I just uh, just wanted to just say that, you know, kind of piggybacking on what uh, Mata was saying regarding uh, the decolonization, um, I think it's something for, for, and I would love to to get your thoughts uh, quickly on the decolonization of academia, because uh -huh. I think that's a, you know, Louis Armstrong didn't go to college, okay, the uh -huh. greatest jazz musician of all time. Uh -huh. Nacky Cole didn't go to college, you know, Sinatra didn't go to college, and it's so many of these, you know, so many of the most brilliant artists in all mediums of art have never gone to college. And I think that for this work to really manifest itself, there it seems to me that this, and we and we know how academia is framed, but we know the structure of academia in this country. And we know, you know, I've been to the conservatory, you know, I, I understand like how that all works and it is not reflective of the true talent in the world. I mean, yes, talented individuals go there, but it's not the whole picture. So how do you speak to that? Because that's, that's, that's in my opinion, is how you really make major impact is, is you, you touch the, the brilliance of artists who are not in these institutions. Hmm. It's a huge, huge question, right? I mean, you know, the, the issue of colonization in universities is massive. Um, we've, you know, tried to do some small things and Erin again knows we, when we host convenings, um, you know, we have to work really hard to push against our systems, academic systems in regard to who we can pay and how we can pay them, right? And those sorts of things. And so, we, we work internally to, you know, try to change those systems, you know, in those ways so that we can bring in artists who don't have degrees to teach in our programs, to present in our programs, you know, to make sure they get paid at the same rates. Um, I mean, there's just so many things to touch on here where we also are really pushing hard against the peer review system, you know, which I believe breeds mediocrity because those who peer review just want to see their own ways of thinking often, you know, um, lifted up. And so they push back against, you know, new and different ways of thinking, ways of writing. Um, so I've been working with Health Promotion Practice Journal that I think is really, you know, activating some really good examples of how, how the peer review system can change in academia, um, you know, but, but 
We also, we created a digital badge program in which, you know, community-based artists are the teachers, you know, and are the um, sort of mentors. So we've tried to, in a number of instances, flip the sort of valuation roles and bring, you know, undegreed, you know, not that the degree matters, right? But to just bring the artists who hold the knowledge and hold the wisdom into the leadership teaching roles. Um, so, I mean, that's a massive question. We have huge, huge problems, right? In academia, academia like healthcare is one of the systems that just needs to get like our constitution, stop me, um, you know, that just needs to be re redrawn, rewritten, right? In so many ways. So there's a lot of problems. And I think the ways in which we look at how we participate on a daily basis and the things that we can change in the ways in which we participate, especially where we hold power in academia, um, are the ways we can make change because attacking it from above is um, is hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I see something in that point. Uh, I think it's an excellent point and uh, I agree with what you say and I agree with also speaking the language to reach to the gatekeepers, but I also believe like one of the ways to stop the devaluation of art is actually using the art in these events, like yeah. in these convincing factors. So yes to the data, yes to the research, and yes to showing videos about programs doing this, but maybe also having, designing an experience, an emotional experience, an artistic experience in these presentations, in these moments to the people who have not experienced it. Yeah. So they actually have not the information like empiric information, but the like gut information of this mm -hmm. thing. And this is our language. And this is actually our way of putting our language into the system yeah. also. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, use it, the gut. Yeah. Because <laughs> like more and more data is coming out about how important that is from a nervous system perspective of experience. <laughs> it's not just like some random thing anymore. People actually like believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm going to use this time to yeah, 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 wrap it yeah, up, yeah. but thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a thrill, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, many ideas generated. Can you put your hands for her? Yeah. What? Another can hand? you put your hands? Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. I'm just such a huge fan of this program and the work that you all are doing, so thank you for Plenty of points for follow up. I'm absolutely available if you guys would like to come and taking your hostage. Yeah, <laughs>